there, there's a library tent up near the front, and I dropped a few books off there the other day, and I was reading one, them on the tee when I came in. I hadn't looked at these books in a long time. One of them was on um, the People's History of the United States, written for um, 1776, the People's Bicentennial. And there's a good description there of the, the period in 1960, of 1760s before the Revolutionary War, uh, looking at economic grievances of the people against Britain, uh, not so much for imposing tax, because the, you know, the Boston Tea Party, which is seen as sort of we don't like being taxed, the, the tax was actually well, uh, the tax actually lowered the cost of tea in the colonies because it gave a monopoly to the British East India Tea Company. And it gave them a monopoly, they collected a tax, but the price was lower. And the colonists opposed that because they didn't want things monopolized by a corporation. The colonists were very anti-corporate. The colonies, once they became independent, separately uh, imposed a lot of anti-corporate laws. Corporations could not last forever. Corporations had to serve a public corporations had to serve a public function. Corporations, stockholders and corporations were personally liable for the damages done by the corporations. All of that changed in the 1800s. But in the 1760s, with the Stamp Act, it's, it's a really a fascinating history. And that, and that popular up, uh, uprising against external control of our lives extended from the 1760s through the Revolutionary War and writing the Constitution into the 1790s when we had the Whiskey Rebellion. There's another book in there in the Whiskey Rebellion I was also looking through. The Whiskey Rebellion, which I knew nothing about until like three days ago, um, was a, a rebellion and a potential secession of Western Pennsylvania, Maryland, from the new United States in opposition to Washington, which was federalizing law and federalizing um, taxes. And so it's a fascinating history, and, and, and that battle was kind of lost and buried in our popular histories of the revolutionary period when we, we think about the Constitution. Very quickly, I just want the revolutionary, the Declaration of Independence, I think, could be seen as a, as a revolutionary document. We don't want to be controlled by people other places. The Constitution could be seen as a counter-revolutionary document. It was an effort to make sure the people couldn't change anything. It was a way of preventing the states from going their separate ways. It was a way of preventing masses of people from demanding change and getting it. Democracy, which doesn't appear in the Constitution, democracy is a word that was seen as a negative. It was seen as mob rule. And the Constitution, in many of its provisions, is a way to keep things from changing um, much at all. Do anybody was an abolition of the law as it is now? No. Let me let me get let me get to that. Let me. When most people complain about law, and you hear this in jokes, we joke about judges sometimes. We joke about lawyers all the time. Um, sometimes, so, so the attitude when things don't go right in the legal system is to blame the people, blame the individuals who are the, the legislators, the police, the judges, the ones who are carrying out policy and making policy. Sort of a higher level of critique is a critique of the system that creates the laws. But the problem with our laws, according to this view, is that the laws are written by people who don't represent them. If we get different people into Congress, they'll write different laws. If we get different judges, they'll be on our side instead of the other side. And a lot of the battle over federal judges, a lot of battle over the, over Supreme Court justices, has to do with trying to get the right judge in there who's going to see things our way. Presidents appoint judges to the, to the federal courts who they think will see things their way. Usually they're right, sometimes they're wrong. And so we end up with judges appointed for political philosophy reasons. Anarchists and, and Marxists, Marxists have that same view. You know, according to from what I understand of Marxist theory, if the working class controlled the law, then we'd have better law. Right? We'd have a different system, a different state, and, and things would be better because the, the, the focus of the law would be on helping the people instead of the capitalists. Anarchists traditionally have had a different view of law, that it doesn't matter who writes the law, it doesn't matter who enforces the law, it doesn't matter who's making those decisions, there's something wrong with the nature of law as a decision-making and conflict resolution mechanism. And, and anarchists have focused on uh, the way law takes disputes out of the personal, interpersonal, community level 
and turns it into a bureaucratic process where we apply general principles to specific cases, even if those principles don't make sense in those particular cases. So when somebody loses an appeal at the Supreme Court uh, on a death penalty case because their lawyer um, didn't get the, the appeal in on time, the, the court um, can say, sorry. And it's not because they, they want the person to die. It's not because they even are in favor of the death penalty. It's because that's the way the law is applied. And there, every, every legal system has a way to get around that, to, to try to bend it. But the, the more that you bend it, the more you're getting away from the law, the way um, legal theorists have generally understood it, and the way that when people say everyone has to be treated. Right now, there's a debate online about whether we should have asked for a permit to be here. Someone polled Boston City Councilors about, first, do they agree with our goals, and second, do they, do they like that we don't didn't get a permit? And so half of them didn't answer. Um, the rest all pretty much found the goal they could agree with, and they're all on our side. No one asked them, like, well, how does Boston City Council tie into corporate power? You know, it would be a follow-up question. Uh, but then they split. Some of them said, well, we should have gotten a permit. They like what we're doing, but we should have gotten a permit because everyone has to be treated the same. You don't make distinctions. And that's a very legalistic, um, technocratic way to do it that anarchists have often criticized and favored instead ways of conflict resolution, ways of decision making that don't look to a general principle and then apply it no matter whether it fits those circumstances or not. Uh, I have a question. If laws were abolished as they are now in American society, some people view them as impediment to Hey, do you think law is a moral standard? I, don't think laws I mean, are moral. I, th I think law law teaches people if we don't have a law, we're not going to be good to each other. You know, the reason that I'm not like stealing your stuff right now is because I'll get arrested. You know, it's like so. That's the kind of the theory that you know, if there's no law against it, uh, if there's a law against it, that means I'm not going to do it. And, and most people don't go around stealing things all the time. Most people have never murdered anybody and don't really want to. Well, the people in these buildings do. <laughs> well, the people, the people in these buildings, cor corporations are a product of law. There were no corporations before we had a legal system that established the ability of corporations to exist. They're a legal, a legal fiction, a legal thing. The only reason that they can control property, the only reason that they aren't, um, that they don't have to serve a public function anymore is because the law allows that. You know, we, we could, instead of um, demanding a constitutional amendment to end corporate personhood or put brakes on corporations, we could abolish corporations. You know, I mean, this is, corporations are a creation of the state and it's something that um, isn't inherent in the way societies function, communities function. That should be a political decision. If what we want is a democratic society, a democratic economy, we should be part of that. We don't have a say in how the economy runs. It's a very anti-American notion that the people should have input into how the economy runs. Um, in terms of how we get from here to there, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. I think clearly people who grew up in society have adopted those norms and expectations. And if the law and the police and the judges all disappeared uh, tomorrow, there'd be a full range of different kinds of reactions to that. And some people would be dangerous and other people would not. And my guess is law is not going to just disappear all at once. That the anarchists, for the most part, I think, uh, are pushing towards pointing out the problems with resolving things through legal means, looking for alternative ways. If there's a dispute here, uh, and there have been disputes here, you know, the solution isn't to bring in a cop from outside and have them resolve the dispute or arrest someone. The, the, the solution is to, to get people here who are trained in conflict de-escalation. There is training in conflict resolution, conflict de-escalation. We've seen this at the General Assemblies at times, where somebody gets up and is acting in a way that other people see as disruptive, and, and no one, I don't think anyone has to call the cops yet, but we've, we've managed to figure out ways to do that. So this is part of the experiment. This is part of the anarchist experiment and how you create a community without having somebody empowered to tell people what to do, without people being empowered to uh, arrest people and, and turn them over to authorities who have the power to make decisions.
I don't I don't one hundred percent consider myself an anarchist, but I'm like entirely sympathetic towards the anarchist position. Um, and I see that as the end result of any sort of egalitarian minded movement or, or ideology. Sorry, are you in any way sympathetic towards the notion that there are at least large elements of Marxism that can be seen as a transition towards the society that no longer needs laws and no longer needs needs a state apparatus at all. I don't know that I know enough about it to, to say. I think from what I know of, of Marx, Marx, Marxism as opposed to Marx, there's a lot of different variants of that. You know, I hear people tell me Marx wasn't the Marxist and said so himself. So I don't, I don't quite... You know, it's not something that I've really kept up with. I know that Marxists and anarchists have always worked together, yeah. although it's always been controversial. Yeah. And, and the little I know with the history of the 1800s is that Mark, uh, communists and anarchists worked together in the international and the labor movement and then split up over this issue of sort of ultimate goals and over um, questions of um, how hierarchical, how horizontal the decision-making process is versus kind of a vanguardist notion. But that's not, that's not really something I've paid a lot of attention to. There's a very good piece on um, Marx's differences with Bakunin called Spectus on Bakunin, written by Marx in 1875-76, where Bakunin asks a number of questions and Marx tends to answer them. Um, but their relationship at best was chilly. Although I have to say that Bakunin actually translated Das Kapital into Russian. It came to Russia through Bakunin, and he always thought that Marx was an excellent economist. He just disagreed with him about this whole dictatorship of proletariat. So today, there are a lot of anarchists and, and a lot of Marxists and others who, in, in keeping sort of with branding, instead of using the term anarchist, they use the term anti-authoritarianism. So there, there are people who have anti-authoritarian groups, meetings, um, magazines, websites, and so you'll, you're beginning to see more of that language as a way to maybe get around the branding right. problem, but also to, to bring people in who aren't anarchists, but who can identify with, with being anti-authority in the way that it's currently structured in society. But go back another, another term that used to, my introduction to anarchism as a philosophy really came here in Boston in the 1970s when I answered an ad for a house looking for new people. And they, they said that they were part of a political um, group that did community gardening and study groups, and they called themselves libertarian socialists. And so I moved in, and it turned out, well, that meant anarchism. So liber libertarian was a word that used to be associated with the left. Here in the United States, it's been co-opted by kind of individualist anarchists, and, and libertarian now is sort of this kind of right-wing anarchism. So it's, it's very controversial. Wikipedia has these constant battles back and forth on, on the anarchism pages over who controls the definition. Um, but, but there are different terms. Historically, libertarian socialism, and even libertarian, what, what was a reference to anarchist principles. Um, um, going back to what you were saying about uh, anarchy and the law, uh, there are provisions in all of our charters that uh, provide for uh, public access to petition government. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that we're here to protest against, in a way, is the influence of lobbies um, on our government. And yet, isn't that sort of a sort of a form of anarchy? Is having individuals like Bank of America and and. Uh, Halliburton and companies like, and, and large groups like, um, you know, American Enterprise Institute uh, petitioning our government, um, you know, working outside and, you know, creating law uh, outside of, you know, the, 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 the power structure of, of organized government. Isn't that, in a way, a form of anarchy in itself? I guess my response to that would be, if you look at the actual existing web of domination by capital, that view sort of falls apart immediately. Um, and I guess one thing I wanted to, I was particularly interested in the psychology aspect of this talk, and one question that I've been pursuing in my own mind is like, I'm aware of these critiques of psychology as being individualist, for instance. My question is like, is there things that our movement can learn from psychology? For instance, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot 
is viewing the small political activist group as like essentially like a group therapy unit and trying to apply concepts from that because I do I do think our group process is, is not where it needs to be yet. That's, that's an excellent point which I've been struggling with for the last few decades but especially the last couple of years. Um, and, and I said before that anarchists have always had recognized the importance of changing ourselves in order to function better and be healthier. But we've had anarchists have always had as much trouble as anyone else trying to be non-competitive and non-possessive. Um, and so you would think that anarchists would pay more attention to how to do that. And there is this tradition of radical therapy that has tried to address that. Um, my experience has been, going back to the 70s, there were political groups, anarchists and others, who were so focused on our message and our work that we weren't going to be distracted by dealing with our own stuff. And then there were people who were so focused on fixing themselves, on the human potential movement, the new age movement, um, and they might acknowledge that, yeah, we want the world to change too, but the way they were going to change the world was by learning more about themselves, becoming better people, interacting with other people better. And there was a big gap between these two groups, and there were very few groups that I knew of back then that tried to bridge that gap. Movement for New Society, which was a big group in Philadelphia, um, uh, which lasted for a while. They had a, a dozen or two dozen communal households. They also uh, did a lot of uh, interpersonal, personal work. They came up in the 70s to do nonviolence training for people in the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, they're not around anymore, but a book, which I haven't seen yet, but a book came out this last year about the Movement for New Society perspective. The last year or two, I've been looking at groups that are sort of on the other side, groups that come out of the human potential movement that claim to want a new society and a new culture. And, I, and, and I'm sort of trying to explore this to see where we can bridge that gap, because I think, I think that's an important point. We don't... If, if, if I think it's too narcissistic to figure out, well, why am I feeling joy at buying a new computer? Or why am I feeling jealous about a relationship? Or why am I, you know, if, 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 if I don't want to look at those things, I'm never going to figure out. I can try to shove them aside. And people who are gung-ho political activists often just shove things aside. Which to me means two things. First, we get an awful lot of done, even though we push those things aside. But I think we could do more if we knew how to work groups better, if we knew how to make decisions better. And a lot of it comes up here, just sitting around and being in a lot of the general assemblies and seeing people talk. Um, I said before that things here work generally in sort of an anarchist design, but a lot of the specifics, to me, sort of don't work that well. Community group structure, you don't have a structure where everybody here is connected to a small group that meets and works on issues within the group. And, and has has networks with other groups instead. It, it seems to me more sort of a top-down thing than I think the rhetoric um, describes. It comes up in issues like direct action. You know, we have a direct action. I think at one point the direct action working groups split into two direct action working groups because they had different senses of what direct action meant. The anarchists have, have the anarchists have had an anarchist caucus. Um, and having to reassure the General Assembly that we weren't going to um, trash a, a, an action that the General Assembly decided on, you know, preserving the right to act differently elsewhere. I think the notion of direct action has been bandied about back you know, when I came across the term in the 70s and 80s. Direct action meant not petitioning the government, not asking for legal change, not talking about how anybody else should do anything different. Direct action meant directly trying to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. If you want, we wanted to block nuclear plant construction, the goal was to get on the site, stand in front of the machines, and prevent construction. Not to get arrested outside, appealing for people to do that. So anarchists in particular have often resisted the notion of petitioning, asking for changes in the law, asking other people to do things that we should be able to do ourselves. And not just anarchists, people in the anti-war movement, in the anti-Vietnam war movement, blocked trains of troop transports going to Vietnam. They didn't just ask the government to not send the troops. They blocked trains. We still have people, mostly from the religious direct action, non-anarchist, but religiously motivated Catholic worker in similar communities, 
that are still getting arrested for going into nuclear facilities and banging with hammers on the nose cones of the silos that nuclear missiles are on, and they're still in prison. They're still going to federal prison because they want to prevent this nuclear missile from going off. They go cut through the fence. They bang on the nose on, on the silo to try to damage it. Then they get arrested, and they do it. They get arrested peacefully. But their goal on the site isn't just to make an appeal. Isn't just a petition. It's to show what if thousands of people were doing that, we might actually stop those missiles from taking off if they were ever long. If thousands of people were preventing troops from going to the Middle East, we might actually stop those. So when the longshoremen um, get involved in action and stop loading um, warships, for example, that's a huge thing. And, and so it's a very different model of trying to create change than petitioning and looking at which legal reform might work best. Can anyone see other things that have come up here that you think are relevant to this discussion in terms of the way decisions are being made or leadership or actions? Uh, I kind of want to go back to the notions of like how um, anarchism is violent um, and has, is how it's portrayed that way and, um, and, like, and how people use, or the media portrays how anarchists are just like destroying the state and property. Um, and I, I like to push back on that idea that it's more about transforming space, transforming like a park into something that's a community space. And that's, I think that's more what anarchism is, is what it's trying to teach. Um, and it's also not lawlessness, it's like anti-authoritarianism, as you talked about, because even the General Assembly, if that's going to be a representation of anarchism or, you know, community development, there's rules of how you vote, how we talk. I mean, that's organized society. That's, yeah, you do have law in a sense. You have organized communication. So, um, but I mean, I think those are all anarchist ideals, and I don't think we should think about it as like violent or anti-law. I think it's just looking at how we can change individuals and how we interact with each other. Um, that's, the, that's the ideals of anarchism. Is it, is it the nature of uh, civil disobedience to break the law or to break uh, some sort of social norm? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it really, it wouldn't be civil disobedience if it wasn't being disobedient. Yeah, I think civil disobedience is more about um, being like upset with the system as, as it is for you I and challenging the, action, the laws. The action of civil disobedience. Wow. So like, you know, uh, blocking traffic here or something like that to gain attention or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or, or what they did on the Brooklyn Bridge. There's some, some of the issues that have come up here and in Wall Street and other places um, dealing with some of these questions. One is the question of violence. Um, there is there is a tradition within anarchism of violence, mostly a century old of assassinations of heads of state, corporate leaders. It was never the dominant form of anarchist organizing, but it was there, and it was uh, part of the image of anarchism, and it was what led to the Red Square, the Red Scare in 1920, where basically the federal government rounded up anarchist immigrants and sent them back to Italy and Poland wherever else they came up with. We also um, have the but but anarch there's always been these different trends. There's, there's anarchists who have favored what they call propaganda of the deed, which originally meant a bunch of things and was taken to mean assassinations of political leaders. But there have also always been um, pacifist anarchists. There have been um, uh, religious Catholic workers. There's a, a pacifist anarchist Catholic organization that has been here for a very long time. They, you know, they, they have uh, centers here in Massachusetts. Um, anarch anarchism today, but the question isn't so much people advocating violence, the question uh, has to do with defining violence. And, and this has been controversial within a lot of movements. Um, and many anarchists uh, would argue that violence is violence against people. Anarchists uh, pretty routinely, I think, these days are against any violence to people, to individuals. There's a split about whether property destruction is violence, can be described as violence, or whether um, uh, blocking traffic, which some people say, well, that's violent because you're causing people to stop what they're doing. You know, most anarchists would say that blocking traffic is not a violent act. Uh, but there are people, including people here, who don't want any disruption. And there's you know, sort of a philosophical difference about how this movement develops. Do we develop by toning things down, talking to the cops, not marching any place we're not supposed to go, not blocking traffic, not breaking windows, and then we might just stay here forever. Or do we grow by being more militant, by coming up with different actions that are disruptive? I, hear the, I wasn't here. I hear the other day Northeastern students marched here and blocked traffic for uh, 20 minutes or something. And then after some negotiation with 
um, the cops, they came in and had their rally. And I'm not sure that would have come out of here, because here there's been this effort not to be disruptive, and the anarchists, I think, have been sort of bending over backwards, not to piss people off. But th there is this, this issue of just how, you know, how much disruption um, is too much. We're getting a lot of support from unions and other people who are making clear that they like the way things are going, and what happens is the tone changes. And what are the goals? Are the goals to basically be where the city wants us to be and do what the city wants us to do, or is the goal to um, not, so, not be so cozy and try to come up with other means. But the property destruction thing is important, and my guess is it will come up here again at different points. Um, it will come up if, if groups of people um, break a window or cut through a fence in order to get on property and others denounce them. You know, it's, it's an issue. Should, should the peacekeepers here, should, should the uh, media people identify the people who did that and turn them over to the police? And this is something that has happened in protests, you know, for many years in different places because they're clearly different people with very different tips. So I urge you to sort of keep track of those issues as they come up in General Assembly and other places and try to, you know, make sense of what's going on. My critique, I guess, of, of a lot of keeping things within confined boundaries is that whatever demands come out of a group that's sticking to the rules will be very moderate demands. And I think, I think anarchists to do another talk at some point on parts of this that you can watch. We have a rally starting.